Pedal Cruiser Armor Schemes. This is a topic that tends to get overlooked, even if you're actually interested in battle cruisers, in favor of a certain binary view. You have the British, with their lightly armored ships that like blowing up. And then you have the Germans, with their heavily armored ships that take an insane amount of damage to actually succeed in sinking one. This is largely because the British and Germans, with the exception of the Congo class, are the only ones to actually get bow cruisers into the water. It's also not necessarily wrong, but it does ignore the fact there's actually quite a lot of variation in bow cruiser armor layouts. Even within the Royal Navy, you see a gradual development towards more and more armor, two obvious exceptions aside. And the other navies across the world design bow cruisers as well, with these not always following a sharp binary of no armor or all the armor. They certainly follow similar tracks, but it's not exactly the same. In fact, there's cases where they go to even greater extremes than the British would. Looking at the Lexingtons here. This video will, as such, serve as a companion to my previous videos on battleship turret layouts. As for why I'm choosing to do bow cruisers before battleships, well, that's personal bias, really, as I've always found bow cruisers to be a fascinating and underappreciated topic. With that out of the way, we can start, of course, with the British, where, in spite of the enduring meme of Jackie Fisher snorting a line on a table and coming up with speed as armor on endless repeat, things weren't quite that simple. Now, I'll admit I'm not going to go terribly in-depth on the actual development of bow cruisers here, not least because I already have two videos on the topic of British ships, and a couple on German ships for that matter. The simplest thing to remember when looking at the armor scheme is that the first bow cruisers, the Invincibles and their closely related successor, were outgrowths of the armored cruiser concept, big cruisers that could serve on foreign stations and chase down commerce raiders, just now equipped with the same all-big gun design as the new Dreadnoughts. This would allow the ships to sink anything they could catch and outrun anything that could outgun them in turn. For this early concept of Dreadnought armored cruisers, armor just really wasn't as important as speed and firepower. As a direct result, you do get speed as armor as a concept. These early battle cruisers had 6-inch armored belts, which narrowed to 4 inches towards either end of the ship. This is nearly identical to the armor scheme of the last British armored cruisers, which makes sense when you consider what the Invincibles were actually intended as. After this, though, armor begins a steady process of increasing in each ship design. First in the Lion, then even further in Tiger, where it reached 9 inches at the thickest. This is admittedly still lighter than German ships or contemporary battleships. However, it does show an acknowledgement of the fact that battle cruisers would actually have to fight similarly armed ships, and more armor was in fact a good idea, in the face of the fact their targets would have heavier firepower. Had the Great War not intervened, it is fairly likely this process would have continued, with things like the hypothetical Super Tiger, for example. However, the Great War did intervene, and that's where Jackie Fisher comes back in, and you really get the speed as armor meme. You have the Renowns revert to 6-inch belts, and then you have the Courageous class, which may as well have been unarmored for all the good their 3-inch belt would have been. Even the early designs of the Admiral class would have been lighter armored, more akin to Tiger, were it not for the wrong lessons being taken from Jutland. That increased Hood's armor to 12 inches, which is the thickest armor ever mounted on a completed British bow cruiser. Yes, I know Hood can be argued more as a fast battleship because of this, but still. The final actual design of a British battle cruiser to get near to completion, the G3, continued where Hood left off. These ships were intended to have a 14-inch belt, which is thicker than most any battleship preceding them. That these ships are battle cruisers is really down only to the fact that the N3 design was even more ludicrous. So the G3 is a bow cruiser because it adhered to the faster than contemporary battleship by sacrificing armor and firepower thing. Most people will consider these ships to be fast battleships in all but name though, even more than Hood. Now, across the channel, things had been rather different. 
The Germans, of course, had an entirely different conception of what a battle cruiser was from the start. Their Grosse design began with relatively heavy armor and ended with what might as well have been light battleship protection. This is largely due to deciding that their equivalent to a British battle cruiser needed to be able to fight in the line of battle as much as a battleship, albeit in more of a fast scouting role. This resulted in von der Tann starting with chest shy of 10 inches, 250 millimeters, on her belt, and ending with their flinger having chest shy of 12 inches, 300 millimeters, on her belt. Germany's final two designs to get close to actual service, Mackensen and Ersatz York, had basically the same armor scheme as their flinger. Being as the Germans were pretty consistent in their designs, I won't go over them as I did the British here. They serve as the counterexample to the British of how battle cruisers can have heavy armor by sacrificing firepower instead of armor for speed. But there isn't really very much variation in their designs, so instead we'll go to the other mainland European powers that actually designed battle cruisers at the height of their popularity. I will make a quick note here though. The Germans would eventually come around to doing basically the renown when they get to the O class some 20 years later. As for the Great War era, let's start with France, Germany's mortal enemy. Only three French designs went anywhere in this period, all three of which were designed much more akin to the German practice than to the British one. These were ships that had to fight in the line of battle, as France flat out couldn't afford to build an entirely different kind of ship for a specific role like the British could. I must note, however, these were primarily design studies. Had the Great War not intervened, these, or something similar, might have been built, but they might also not have been built. That being said, they do serve as a useful glance at French design priorities, but by no means are these ships that got close to construction. With that caveat out of the way, the first of the three designs was, fundamentally, a battlecruiser version of the Normandy-class battleship. The same amount of guns, of the same caliber, and the same turret layout, only with the amidships turret moved back a bit to make room for increased machinery spaces, as well as losing an inch or so off of the armored belt. This was intended to produce ships of 28 knots, with relatively heavy armor and firepower. In this, the design really was quite like the German style, maybe even going a step further in the fact the ship mounted the same firepower as a contemporary battleship design. The other two design concepts, however, differ much more. While retaining the same armor protection, these two designs ditched one of the turrets. And yet, the first of the two, Design A, was actually slower than the alternative Normandy-derived design, in spite of retaining the same 270mm, 10.6 inch, belt as the previous battlecruiser concept. The second, Design B, once more retained the same armor belt, and this time the same turret layout of a quad turret on either end of the ship, similar to the way twins were mounted on Courageous. But it upped the caliber of the guns to 15 inch. The French, of course, had no such gun, but again, design studies that probably would have required serious refinement to go anywhere. With the French following German practice, what about the Russians? Well, the Russians were actually closer to British conception of battlecruisers in design and original concept. The Borodino, or Ismail, depending on who you ask, originated from a desire to, in the aftermath of the Russo-Japanese War, have a fast wing of heavy armored cruisers. Where they differ from the British is that the Russians weren't concerned with commerce rating or things like that. What they took from the lessons of Tsushima was a need for fast cruisers to maneuver and strike the leader of the enemy battle line, as had been done to them by the Japanese. So while the intended role was different, the concept was at least similar. As was the way the design evolved. Beginning as big armored cruisers, with dreadnought caliber guns and relatively light armor but fast speed, the ships would drastically change before construction began. A full redesign, in fact, which somewhat mimicked how the British concept of battlecruisers was developing, but all in the process of designing one ship. The Russian battlecruisers went from kinda like Invincible to more like the Splendid Cats, 
what began as 190 millimeters, 7.5 inches for belt armor, would end up with 237 millimeter, 9.35 inches, in the end. This made the Russian battlecruisers something very much like the British in terms of protection, coming in right around the same kind of protection as the Splendid Cats had. Slightly thicker, but not by any great amount. That just leaves the Austrians now. The Italians didn't really develop battlecruisers in this period, and their interwar designs never really went anywhere either. While at first resistant to the very concept of battlecruisers, since these were, and I quote, ships for a navy that has the need to control vast oceans, which is actually a shockingly mature thought for a turn-of-the-century navy, the Austrians would change their tune during the war. Going from seeing the type as a wasteful luxury for a navy occupied with the Adriatic and Greater Mediterranean, to designing multiple different concepts of a battlecruiser. This was probably influenced by seeing how the British and German battlecruisers performed. Which makes it less than surprising that the concepts ended up becoming something of a mix of British and German designs. The Austrians seem to have decided early on that they wanted ships with relatively heavy armor protection, though not to the same extent as the Germans, or even the French. Their battlecruisers would have had a belt of 225mm thickness at its absolute thickest, which is about 9 inches for the non-metric users. This is, once more, about the same as the Splendid Cats, which is leapfrogging right over the early Invincible style protection. I'm sure most of you are probably noticing a theme here at this point. As it is, however, the Austrians weren't that far off the protection of their existing battleships here. The Tegadov class had a belt that came in at 280 millimeters, 11 inches, in its own thickness. This puts the hypothetical battlecruisers at only 2 inches, give or take, less armor, which actually does bring them a bit more in line with German practice. They just began from a lighter armored battleship, so the battlecruisers reflected this. With the European powers out of the way, though, we have only two nations left here, Japan and the United States. With the Americans, well, I went over this in some greater detail in the Lexington class video. To summarize for the purposes of this one, the United States bucked the global trend of bow cruiser design in quite a number of ways. Nowhere more so than in the general trend of increasing armor protection. While there were certainly attempts made at getting either an American Congo or some form of fast battleship, the Lexington design pretty early on settled with very thin armor protection, considering the size of the ship and when it was to be built. The final design, at its thickest, only managed a 7-inch belt. While slightly thicker than the Renown armor scheme, this was far and away thinner than any contemporary bow cruiser that would have entered service in the 1920s. This is reflective of their intended role as giant scouts to lead the Omahas and four Sacker destroyers around, yes, but it is also a sharp deviation from both general American practice of heavy armor and that of other bow cruisers around the world. As we've established, even the Royal Navy was moving away from this. The sheer scale of the ship didn't really help matters here, because it was a lot of target with not much protection from incoming shellfire. Still, I suppose that American powder and powder handling at least made the ships less likely to blow up in spite of the thin armor. With that out of the way, though, we're left with the final nation to really get anywhere with battlecruisers, Imperial Japan. Here's an interesting one, since Japan started out with what is, for all intents and purposes, a second-generation British battlecruiser, before going off and doing their own thing when they got around to designing their own version. First, and ignoring their attempts to go, yeah, no, our last armored cruisers are totally battlecruisers. Scout's honor. You have the Congo. This was a British design ship that was, in most ways, an improvement on Lion, but built to the same general concept. Her armor protection was slightly thinner, though this was compensated for with the heavier guns she mounted. Congo's bell was 203 millimeters, 8 inches thick, at its thickest. Not the thinnest, but also not the thickest of designs around at the time. The later rebuilds mostly just brought her upper and lower belts to the same thickness instead of actually increasing that 8-inch belt. Where things get interesting with Japan is what they would do with the follow-on Amagi class. These ships increased the armor protection up to slightly less than 10 inches, 250 millimeters, 
which is admittedly less than, say, Hood. However, the reason for this relatively thinner armor is that the ships carried 10 16-inch guns. The Japanese had decided to go completely in their own direction and build ships that still managed 30 knots, but doing it by having heavier firepower than a lot of battleships at the time. Exactly the same as the very similar Tosa-class battleships, in fact. Even the British style of battlecruiser sacrificed firepower compared to contemporary battleships to gain speed, which is not the case here. It does show the way to the fast battleship in a similar vein as Hood. That's where this story mostly comes to an end, though. It's almost funny in a way that other than the Congo, which is really a British design, the Lexington, and the initial design of Borodino, all of the battlecruisers developed had armor at least on par with the Splendid Cats. Even the Russians would eventually end up there. The idea of battlecruisers having paper armor is shaped a lot by what happened at Shetland and the design of the Invincibles. And the renowned and courageous, I'll grant you that too. Their armor was universally thinner than contemporary battleships, but for the most part, not by as much as you'd actually expect. And while the Germans were certainly on the extreme end of armoring their bow cruisers, even the British eventually decided that maybe the Germans had a point. And thus we start getting battle cruisers that might as well be fast battleships. It's interesting how things turned up that way, isn't it? Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content. I'll see you in the next one.